sometimes uh, the name of a plant is a clue as to how it was used in earlier times in herbal medicine. And Eyebright is a good example. Uh, a name in English as old, at least as old as the 15th century. Uh, in German it's Augenklar, which is equally old and means the same thing. In Irish it's Glanrusk, which again means Eyebright. And the reason for all of this uh, is the eye-like appearance of the flowers. Not, as you might have thought, because of their bright sparkle, but because the purple lines and egg yolk yellow uh, markings on the petals suggested an eye with an infection. This is another example of the old doctrine of signatures, where people believed that God would have left clues in the appearance of the flowers as to what he intended them to be used for. But the doctrine of signatures aside, there are a few wildflowers which more elegantly demonstrate a deeper significance, that of zygomorphy. The journey that many wildflower families have made over the long 60 million years course of their evolution from radial symmetry to bilateral symmetry and from an upward look to a sideways gaze in the structure of the flowers. No wildflower is more classically and beautifully zygomorphic, with upper and lower lips. The upper lip with two reflexed lobes, the lower three-lobed, each of these three lobes bifid. The nectar guides couldn't be clearer. These purple lines and the egg yolk blobs on the platform of the lower lip and either side of the entrance to the spur. The purple lines converge on the throat of the flower, at the back of which is an arrow spur containing nectar. The nectar tube is four to six millimetres deep, widening towards the top, and the main pollinators are bees, hoverflies, and some moths. There are four stamens under the protective hood of the upper lip, just behind the protruding stigma above. The stamens are a long way from the simple club-like structures of many flowers. Each anther is divided into two prominent lobes, and all eight lobes are joined together in an elegantly complex way in two rows of four, dehissing and shedding their pollen downwards. On the underside of each anther there is a pair of spines or latches, the lowest ones longer and projecting over the throat of the flower where a visiting bee is bound to knock against them and tip the pollen onto itself. You can see these latches clearly at the back. Frilly white brushes on the fringes of the upper latches prevent pollen from spilling wastefully to the sides. As you look into the flower you can see these brushes right at the front facing you. Notice the unusual way the filaments connect with the anthers, keeping close to the wall of the hood so as not to get in the way of visitors. One important and characteristic feature of Eyebright and its relatives, and one that is not at all apparent at the surface, is that they are hemiparasites. Uh, parasitic, drawing the nutrients from the roots of grasses and other plants, and then using these nutrients to manufacture their own food. Now, apart from its widespread use in the past and to some extent today in treating eye infections, Eyebright also had uh, quite a range of other uses uh, in herbal medicine uh, and, and beyond. Um, one of the many recipes, or recommendations, one that appeals to me and which is on my current bucket list, is a recommendation made by the great Elizabethan polymath Gervais Markham, who advises us to drink every morning a small draught of eyebright wine. And this recommendation appeared in uh, a book, two volume work, uh, which in its Elizabethan day was a bestseller, going through at least nine editions from the day of its publication in 1615 to 1683, and which, if for no other reason, is memorable for its title. The English Housewife, containing the inward and outward virtues which ought to be in a complete woman. 